this last session is really on my own take on activity theory. Right? Um, my interest is, is, is not really in psychology as such, my interest is in social theory. I don't like the way the world is, it's got some nice things about it, I wouldn't want to be in a different world just now, but I'm interested in changing it. And I formed a view that the part of the problem with the, th the, the thinking and theories available to deal with the way the world is, that we have uh, sort of a dichotomous view of the world. On the one hand, you have individual people and their comings and goings and their hopes and desires. And on the other hand, you have the great institutions of social life, the, the, the markets, the states, the you know, institutions and so on. And a huge gap between them. And that that gap in the array of theory that's available reflects modern life. The, the people can go about and do what they like and have their activities and things. And we have plenty of um, people studying that. But the things that are done by other people in large numbers uh, are like a, a force of nature. They, they, they can have no impact on them. People get to think that, that markets are markets. It's not people making decisions and doing things. It's just, you know, it's markets political life, civil wars, all these things just happen. And there's nothing you can do about it. The best thing then is to discuss how we live a happy life and, you know, and so on. And, okay, so what we, I, I needed was a theoretical apparatus that could bridge that gap, that was situated in the gap between the individual human condition, uh, typically psychology, and the uh, movements of vast numbers of people uh, as in social theory. So I came to the conclusion that activity theory based on Vygotsky was a theory that could do that. So all m my work um, is so far as I'm doing something positive, trying to find the answers to problems and make suggestions is based on activity theory. Faced with what I found to be very troublesome set of concepts in activity theory. I mean, the basic idea is great, that the basic substance of life is activity. And the activity is made up of, of um, actions, which are, you know, only serve the end uh, of, of the um, activity indirectly, and have their own motivation, and that the development of people's ideas hinged around their participation in their actions participation activity through the various actions. But these, uh, these activities were what made up the world, the social world we lived in. So the, that basic idea seemed to me to be spot on, but there was such confusion about the co basic concepts themselves, it seemed I needed to get in and try and sort these concepts out a little bit to make it usable uh, as, a, as a, a means to solve problems. And so I've decided to use the word project. Uh, the unit of social life is a project. So neoliberalism, Australia, uh, the Liberal Party, uh, immigration, education, science, love, these are all projects. Right? All the things that make up the, the big wide world of social life are projects. But a project is here just another word for an activity. Now, the, the, there's two reasons for choosing a new word. One is to get away from people having fixed ideas about what an activity meant. So if I decide to say, well, activity has an object and this is the meaning of an object or something, you have someone say, no, 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 you don't understand. An activity is like this, because here, Leontief says so, or Engstrom says so, right? So the best thing was to use a different word. But that's, a stiff, that's no solution either. I could say, well, what are you bringing in this project for? What is a project? I don't know what a project is. It's an activity. Well, it's an activity then. You know, so there's, there's no way around it. If you have a theoretical field which is messed up, has fundamentally good ideas in it, but it's messed up, there's no easy solution. But I thought, let's put down a flag, right? and, and, and uh, build around that flag. So it's a project. That's one reason. It's the basic reason of how to conduct 
a clarifying struggle within a, a, a domain of theory. The other thing is it's a great word. It's a word that isn't normally used. I had a friend that attended a, a socialist, or a, a labor historians conference last week. And she said, Andy, you know this uh, woman, X? She, was, she just gave us a great talk about the accord and how it was the beginning of neoliberalism in Australia. And she kept calling everything a project. Has she been you know, reading your stuff? And so I got hold of her and she hadn't. But people do use this concept of a project. And generally speaking, they, if they're in that area of political science or social theory or something, they use it in the same way I intend it. Right? Even um, the way people use it in education, as in um, project work, is quite uh, compatible with what I want to say, how I want to use this concept. So it's a word that has an ordinary, everyday, intuitive meaning that people can grasp without having to read the textbook. And basically, if you know what the word project means, you're 90% of the way there to understanding what I'm on about. In other words, you've grasped the, 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 the core of activity theory, if you know what a project is. Right? Much better than having a word like activity, which is so polysemous, has so many different meanings and nuances. Right? Project has different meanings as well, but they're, they're all meanings that, that go quite well. They're, they're real. Uh, in the idea of an activity. So a, pro a project is something that has an object and I'd say specifically the object of a project is the, the concept it has to itself. So for example socialism. Yeah. The, the, if someone sees themselves in fighting for socialism then that is that's like a self-concept. We are socialists and I'd say that is how I understand what that project is, how they see themselves, not as uh, an intended um, outcome to be realized so much. Primarily, it's a self-concept. A project is, is not something static. It's, it's people understand, if they've had any sort of life experience at all, that projects have a kind of life cycle. That you set off to win socialism and you end up creating a police state. Right? What comes out at the end is often quite different than what went in at the beginning. That's the process of realization of a concept. That your intentions, when you pursue those intentions, interact with everything else in the world and they become something real, but that what they become is always, absolutely always different from what you intended. If you live in the world, then what you produce is always something in the world that's a product of many different wills, not just your own intention. Right? So a project is therefore a learning experience because you have a certain idea or principle. You know, people should be equal. We should cooperate with each other. That's one of the basic ideas I can think of on socialism. And you go out and you start belting away at those ideas. And things happen and you get reactions. Some f ideas don't go down very well. Some idea turns out to have a very perverse, perverse outcome. Right? So you change things. So let's formulate this differently. Right? So what's happened is a concept which at the beginning of the project was a very abstract concept. It was just a, a general sort of utopian image maybe that someone formed of something. But a hundred years down the track that concept has become very concrete. It's got a hundred years of experience behind it. Now we say this, not that, because if you say this, terrible things happen. So we, we interpret this idea like that. This is a whole experience, like a science. It, it doesn't just say this is how things are. It's got all sorts of opinions about 101 different problems in, within that science. So, in fact, science is itself a project. Yeah. So, when I say that a project is a process of concept formation, yes, the object is, is, is the concept you form, but that doesn't, what that means is that the, the, the activity itself is the realization of that concept. So it's not like um, the concept of, if we go back to what we were talking about a little bit before, here we have a patient that has an illness and we form a concept of that illness Therefore, this is how we're going to tackle it. 
I mean, that, that's fair enough, that, that exists. But in the process of tackling it, you have responses. The, uh, the patient gets up and runs the hell out of the place. Jesus, is that guy carrying a big scalpel? I'm getting out of here. Right? So your, your concept of what you're trying to do in tackling the, the problem develops. Right? So it's a process of concept formation. Yes, the, 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 the project is always has its object, the, 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 co the object concept, but it isn't just given at the start. It actually goes through a process from being a very abstract concept and becomes realized, successively realized, as it becomes more and more concrete, become, it finds itself with a stronger and stronger, more substantial base in the world to a point where it actually is in the world. It's been realized, it exists. And, and, and that's the, the sort of a path of the life cycle of a, of a project, what comes next, okay? Now, I say projects are units of social life. So I don't see the world as made up of social groups. The world's made up of projects and people participate in lots of different projects. But we don't have sort of this community over there and this community over there and we have consumers here and taxpayers there and voters over there, right? So conceiving of the world that they made up of different groups with their interests uh, is, a, is a bankrupt way of understanding the world. The, 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 the world that we live in now, in all its richness, is, is the product of thousands of years of projects. Every word in our language, every custom and habit, every type of object that you find, like a, a, a street sign or a tree, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, as they are through long drawn out projects. You take trees, for example. You might say, well, here's a, a, an elm tree. Now, it's a plane tree, a plane tree. But plane trees don't grow in Australia. Yeah? The, 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 the plane tree is a product of, a, of a, an industry that, that, that uh, sort of singled them out, um, what's the word, sort of bred them sold them to councils as a good street tree, developed people with expertise in them to maintain them, right? The, 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 the existence of plane trees is itself uh, the, the outcome and continuation of a project. So every feature of our world, which we can grasp in terms of a concept, is not only the end product of a, of a project in the past, but is actually the continuing project. So, for example, what this means is that an institution such as medical science has to be taken as a project. And the objective of um, medical science is to eliminate uh, diseases. So this is a very rough and ready definition, but it will do. Now, when the AIDS crisis came along, there was a big conflict between uh, mainly gay men, who are the main uh, people affected by AIDS, and the medical science uh, establishment and the government. But fortunately, we had, you know, we were gifted at that time with a health minister and a Labor government that responded to that situation extremely well. And the, the outcome we had in Australia was a startlingly good one, whereby instead of the medical scientists say, oh, get the hell out of here, we're in charge of finding the, the causes of diseases, we don't want new people involved in it, we'll do our clinical trials, we'll give some people a, what's the word, a placebo, and other people a real medicine and we'll get there. And the, the gay actors said, no, no, you're not. You know, uh, we'll subvert that, we'll find out which is the, the um, a placebo and whatever. And eventually, that, the barriers have broke down, the gay activists, the AIDS campaigners, got into the medical science establishment and they kind of reactivated the real purpose of, of medical science. Right? Likewise, the, the government, who um, usually treats uh, prostitution, uh, drug dealing and such things as social problems that need to be eliminated, bit the bullet and actually made an alliance with uh, prostitutes collective uh, drug users, who essentially always include drug dealers, uh, to put out uh, propaganda about safe sex and got these, these injection recycling, uh, syringe recycling things going, right? 
So the social movements tend to see institutions as, as, as an object. An object in the sense of subject object, a thing out there which is a fixed thing, but overlooking the fact that the object is also a subject which has its own motivation and is capable of, of, of reactivating the reason. So for instance, people talk about uh, science, individual scientists being, motiv being motivated by getting published, getting overseas trips, um, getting prestige, higher pay, promotions and so on. And this is what motivates science. They have this argument, you see, that, that, that climate change is just invented by the, the scientists because they want promotion. Right? But they can't argue against science uh, against climate change because they'll miss out on their promotion, they won't get published themselves apart from the big bad science. Okay, this is a very cynical view of science, but there's an element of truth in it, of course. But uh, scientific institutions are very conservative, and people that come along with, with uh, unusual or off the planet kind of ideas do suffer in their career. Right? But to simply take an institution and reduce it to that kind of uh, individualistic kind of motivation, to look only at the, the sort of the glue that's holding the fibre together and to neglect the reason d'etre of the whole thing, uh, is to turn social life into sort of concrete, whereas social life's continually being renewed and changed. So I take projects begin as social movements. Well, they begin as a glimmer in someone's eye, actually, but they go through a phase of being a social movement. They go pass through a stage of being projects. So, for example, environmentalists and people who belong to the women's liberation movement uh, in decades past got really demoralised when they made certain gains and their uh, demands were, were implemented, and uh, you know, people got appointed to uh, permanent jobs with the government to, to regulate the laws they manage to get past and so on, and the result the social movement demobilizes. But that's a normal part of the life cycle of a project. Right? It is a bit demoralizing when you have the excitement of a social movement and seeing real change happen, and then it becomes institutionalized, and it's sort of boring, humdrum, and a compromise, and you know there are still things left to be done, and they're not being done, and why aren't people angry and so on. But that it's a well-established fact that that's part of the life cycle of projects. Okay, but you understand that when a social movement becomes an institution, it's still part of that life cycle, and and, and changes can happen. And the age struggle proved that that the medical science could be woken up from its uh, sort of state of, of routineism and careerism to actually tackle problems, change the way they do things, and so on. Okay. So, by taking activities as um, to be projects, this provides a kind of frame through which um, uh, we can understand these things. Now, what this means is that if we uh, for, take an example that I've been involved in understanding the asbestos issue, you had a problem for many decades in this country that it was known, publicly known, that asbestos causes uh, terrible uh, disease. And the first thing we came up across, come, come across in trying to do something about this, was that the uh, asbestos industry had medical science in its pocket. It had completely novel medical science. It had taken this negative aspect of science and, and used uh, promotions, uh, uh, overseas trips, uh, funding of research projects, attendance at um, you know, different seminars and so on, as rewards to keep uh, medic medical science quiet about the scientific truth of asbestos. Fortunately, there was really one man um, in New York uh, who took a stand against that and just kept going and going and going to Selikoff, Dr. Selikoff who eventually sort of created enough noise and he cooperated with unions and he managed to, to uh, be an important part of the solution there. But the, we could understand in a sense why the employers were willing to send people to, to their death to make a quick buck. 
because you can understand that from even, you know, the most crass kind of uh, ethical theory, that people will do awful things if they make money out of them, okay? So that's an explanation. But how can you explain that the workers on the line, working in these factories, inhaling all this dust, refused to believe that asbestos was killing them? And even more difficult, how could you explain that a supervisor who was himself dying, and obviously dying of asbestosis and mesothelioma, was sitting in a courtroom and swear blind that uh, he knew nothing about the uh, deleterious effects of asbestos. And, and, and the fact that he had the disease was nothing to do with his job in the asbestos factory. You know, like you talk about people getting to VC for running into a machine gun in the service of their country. Well, he was a guy who's prepared to, 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 to perjure himself in a court uh, with his last breath before he died of the uh, position that the employer gave him. So the thing is that, that a, a project, if we understand it as being oriented around its self-concept, then it's like a science. If, it's, if a science has at its foundation a concept of its subject matter, and from that, as a science matures and develops, all the different problems and aspects that arise in that science connect back to that fundamental concept. And that's why concepts are part of a system, or scientific concepts, or religious concepts, true concepts are always part of a system. They tie together. And so a project is like that. And if someone that works in the asbestos industry is sort of inclined to believe in what they do, that they are a decent human being, they're doing something useful, and their work is providing a wonderful insulation material for the country and so on, they are rather disposed to enter into this to make meaning of their own life through accepting the theory of asbestos production. Then they get this, this, this whole theory which involves uh, dogma about the safe level of asbestos dust and all sorts of things which are complete fictions. There's no safe level of asbestos. One fiber is enough to kill you. Uh, so th that in itself doesn't give you the answer to how to break people out of it, but it, it frames the problem, okay? And um, it, it to me makes, makes sense of why people believe things they do. It's a way of tackling the problem of ideology and how people's ideas reflect their social position. Now, if the idea of a project is to be useful as a unit of social life, then we, it's important that we can tackle the situation of many projects. Not just one beside the other, but how they actually collaborate with one another. That is to say, either cooperate or conflict with one another. And I threw that slide in about um, boundary object, because that's how Engstrom's activity theory does it. It says that different systems of activity can share an object. They're all working on the same raw material, and that's the basis for them understanding each other. Because you may have a theory that homosexuality is a disease, it's a lifestyle, it's a, it's a type of human being or whatever. If you're all dealing with the issue uh, as a real person there, a real community, and by coming to grips with that, there'll be some possibility of these conflicting views of the world to understand each other. Right? So the way I've approached the understanding of the world in terms of there being many, many projects is to look at the way projects collaborate with one another. And I, I, I've categorized this three ways, colonization, negotiation, and solidarity. Colonization, um, it's quite literally colonization where one country takes over another. It also includes philanthropy, where you do someone a favor by incorporating them within your own system of activity. And there's, you could put good or bad spins on it, it doesn't matter. It's a very important way that one um, system of activity, one group of people, one people in a certain situation with a certain problem and trying to solve it,
can be assisted by another by drawing them into your own system of activity. So, for example, if we introduce an idea of multiculturalism, this will be a way of incorporating people with um, trying to lead different kinds of life to make a home in this country, right? So you'd be aware that without some thought about it, colonization can be a negative thing because it, it kills the subjectivity that it colonizes, and therefore you'd moderate it in some way. And you'd have a certain element of solidarity in it. The difference between colonization and solidarity is that in solidarity you assist the other project by voluntarily subordinating your own uh, will or your own project to that of the project that you're assisting. So for example, so if you were uh, a certain uh, group of people were having a strike, solidarity means you go along and join the picket line. You don't turn up with a thousand people you know, and sort of take it over, do you? You turn up modestly and say, look, I'd like to help. What would you like me to do? Would you want me to stand in the picket line? No. Okay, could I take some you know, messages around for people? Okay, you volunteer your service. And that's an important um, distinction because the whole purpose of helping a project generally is for it to build up its own subjectivity, to its own to concept of itself to become stronger to be able to realise it. Whereas helping, which is just colonisation, while you may save the person's skin, stop a project from being <coughs> crushed and defeated, you may do that only at the expense of their identity, if you like, their self-concept. You kept them alive, but by rescuing them, you took away their self-respect. And the third method, which is sometimes called exchange, I call it negotiation, where by there are two projects that are independent of each other, and they cooperate by saying, I'll do this for you if you do that for me. And this is probably in our society the overwhelmingly uh, most prevalent way that different um, projects collaborate with one another. Buying and selling, for example, doing deals, negotiating compromises, whereby the two parties maintain their independence. I'm going to continue um, living in my house, but the council can have some rates. Right? They can do their thing with the rates I give them and I can go on living in my house. I don't have to go on and get involved in the council's business, start collecting rubbish and things. I'll give them some money and I'll do that, which is their role. Okay? So, we live in a bourgeois society and that's based on people doing their own thing but exchanging between them for mutual benefit. Okay. This must be pretty close to my end, of course. <laughs> Gave myself a cheer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've got to the end of the course. Uh, let's just have a bit of a chat about what we've just done. I was talking to my friend Shen, she couldn't. I was talking to my friend Shen, she couldn't make it today. <laughs> she has um, she has work, but um, I don't remember. It's in relation to education. Mm. So how? It's, <clears throat> I think if I'm understanding the Vodsky correctly, it's that uh, it's about the more conscious they are within the activity, the more capable they are of learning something from it. Mm -hmm. So without conscious, without conscious action, you cannot learn. Mm -hmm. So then, Yeah. I think one of the corollaries of the view I'm putting forward is that it's a good thing for people to understand the um, concept that, 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 that they're acting, they're fulfilling or realising a concept of, of, of a project. It's a good thing that you understand that. So that, uh, that does mean that having a critical attitude to what you're involved in. So it's a good thing if a student understands that it isn't just a question of acquiring knowledge, it's also a question of being socialised to the world we're going to be thrown out into and being conditioned to failure 
the, the, the education system provides uh, it's a number of it's serving a number of different motives there. You've got an institution there that has um, it's like a sh it's shared between some different projects. It is the, the social control motive there that the school system fits within a, an apparatus of social control. It also it is, is, is within an apparatus for uh, producing uh, skilled labour. But there are still people working within that system who have a different agenda, aren't they? That are there for emancipatory reasons. And I think I, I, I'm inclined to try and theorise education as, as where there are as several different projects at work there. Because you have, for instance, critiques of the education system which I sort of find so breathtakingly um, pessimistic that education is solely for the purpose of conditioning people to what's going to be their role in life afterwards. Yeah. And, and the, the teachers are just the pawns of this and don't understand what they're doing. They may think that they're opening children's eyes and all this, but really they're fooling themselves. I mean, this is a view, and it's, it's got a certain substance to it. Yeah? Well, I, I studied education and we talked about the factory model, hmm. where it's you know, producing people to the for society. Yeah. And that's that, that's your output and that your input of young kids and output is people that yeah. can do the Would you want to go and work in a system like that? I did for a while. <laughs> <laughs> You're <laughs> rationalizing the fact that you don't any longer. Uh, yeah look and that's a legitimate view. There's an element to the education system which is producing something needed to reproduce the system. It's pumping up products. I always inclined not to see institutions in a flat kind of way. But I, I recognise that there is a social reproduction and a socialisation function of education. That has to be because it's so ubiquitous. Yeah? It'd be, it, it couldn't, but it's also a domain where people go into with different objectives. And, 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 and I, I, I think that it's legitimate. To, those are legitimate objectives and they're real projects. <coughs> Many children come out of their schooling with their eyes open and become excited about different things and so on. And I don't think that that's something to explain the education system as a whole. It's much more likely to be explained in terms of social reproduction. Yeah, so, and this might be getting but wouldn't it be the key idea of any concept is for it to reproduce itself? If it doesn't reproduce itself, then it mm -hmm. no longer exists. It's just yeah. simply evolution. So mm -hmm. then the ideas, the concepts that exist, if they don't reproduce themselves, mm -hmm. if they don't provide a motivation mm -hmm. or a, um, a payback for keeping them alive, mm -hmm. then they won't stay alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, if, if you had, so then, therefore, the ideas that exist in an education system, yeah, there's a payback for them existing. Yeah. For the people that are engaging in those concepts. Yeah. Just a, a sort of converse side to that. There's a, in Michael Cole's book, he's trying to work out, you know, why the hell the education system is in America is failing so badly. And he does a bit of historical investigation and he finds that over the course of the preceding 50 or 60 years there had been some great schools that had really good ideas that really ought to have um, taken off and solved you know, a hell of a lot of social problems and so on. But none of them existed any longer. So why was it? Why was it that the Jewish laboratory school closed down as soon as Jew was gone? And not just that, but dozens and dozens and dozens of other really good school projects died. And what it comes down to is that, that, that these different projects can't exist on their own. Right? It's not enough to have a, a good idea about, a really good idea, I mean, not just you know, a utopia, a really good idea about a kind of school that you could have. You have to win allies uh, in, within the social system 
uh, to support it because the, you know, you might to so have a good idea for new school, you appoint a headmaster or do it yourself uh, and then you get sick or the headmaster gets, you know, leaves to go to a different job, the whole thing falls to bits. Or for example, it's all going well, but the, the local community changes and people move out a new population moves in and suddenly the population that's living where the school is doesn't suit what you're trying to do. Or there's a law change imposing uh, something, you know, like, I mean, Mike, Cole in some papers he's written, but there are a legion of these things, all the different ways that a really good project can fall on a heap. And yet, schooling goes on, and it's crap schooling, right? And governments give billions of dollars for these terrible, you know, ideas about how people should educate them, you know? And, and good ideas uh, don't. So the, the problem then is not just uh, to how to form a good idea uh, for education, but, but how to form allies and how to situate that and ha how to make a collaboration out of it so that you're going to have allies that are going to reproduce themselves and continue to support you or if not be replaced by others. You have to actually uh, deal with a, a multiple kind of relationship between projects if something's going to work. Yeah? And, and any, not only education, any project idea that you've got, you have to start looking at its relationship with other projects, how it's going to will give, meet other people's needs. Yeah? Like if setting up a school, you not only have to give a good education to the kids, you have to make sure, for instance, you don't educate them out of their families. Right? You take, say, a poor, a, a poor community of first generation immigrants who don't speak the native language, and you educate their kids and make them all into fantastic professionals. But, now have no nothing in common with their parents and move out and, and, and maybe the parents see that happening even after you've been there for a few months say hey you're educating our kids out of our community we don't want you employ my kids out so oh sorry about that okay so the parents and there's all sorts of players involved that you, you have to uh, work out some kind of collaboration with them right so the idea of, I mean, from when I first produced this idea of a project, very early on in the first paper where I put that forward, we started to look at the relationship between the way projects collaborated with each other, right? because it's actually integral to the very existence of a project that establishes these relations. Okay? And there's not a, no simple answer to this thing, but, but they're what you've got to deal with. That's the, the substance of the matter. Yeah, it just makes me think of, um, <clears throat> I worked in a think tank a while ago and I came up with like, a, it's, it's a, just simply a concept, there's no, no like hard numbers about it, but like an 80-20, so 80% the same, 20% different. If you're going to present a concept to people for them to be able to take it on, yeah. it needs to be, because I presented a few concepts that were a little too different. Mm and they were brilliant and like I'd like we would work out all the numbers and everything mm. and it, it would definitely work mm. but it's too different for anybody to actually take so you'd be relating to my choice to call the concept a project you'd be relating to that because you're the, the, it's yeah. I don't know if it fits your 80 20 business yeah but I'm saying look this is just an activity it's the same you know all your activity theory is the same concept you know and love right I'm just calling it a project yeah. so Although that generates problems, at least I hope I've got that kind of commonality. And I'll say, yes, you know, it's got an object and uh, it's got a you know, community. And you can identify all the features that are found in, in activity theory with a project. But trying to get that extra 20% in under the heading of a different name. Uh, whereas I thought if you choose something, uh, well, I can put it. I'm wrestling with that same problem, put it that way. It's a unique solution, but I relate to what you're saying. Yeah. So in, in launching a new concept, let's say a new project, yeah, you have to make sure that you don't immediately, in the way you pose it, alienate others who may be your allies. Yeah. And, 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 and a lot of people, if they don't understand it from the onset, mm -hmm. then they're initially going to be opposed. Yeah. So that it yeah. needs to be very similar, just a little bit different. 
so that it can it has traction before it so it can actually yeah. be thought about. Yeah. So this is a bit like my, the asbestos problem as well. That 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 um, people would take a set against something. Very difficult to get around that. Very difficult. So how you first deliver a concept um, has to be such a way that sparks some interest, not sparks of antipathy. Because that, that first view people form of a new idea, like, I don't know if this is a general rule, but you know, if, if something happens out there in the, in the news, or among an extended friends, friendship network, uh, and there's an argument about whether so-and-so really did hit so-and-so, or whether it's just a story. And it might be a dispute about some facts. It's very, very important how a person first hears about it. Yeah? Because when you first hear about it from one party, and you go, oh, okay, maybe this is true, maybe it isn't, and then like the other side comes along, then whatever they say to you is always interpreted in the light of the view you've already formed. Right? And so many arguments I've been involved in have been decided really on the basis of who got people first. And that, and that is interesting when you go to somewhere like India and Canada that refuse to um, ban asbestos mm. actively promote its mm. use. Mm. How they have rejected the concept of stuff to kill you. Mm. Uh, it was the, the, you know, the governments had formed the view that this was great for business, we've got a great industry, mm. we giving employment to people, so we're not going to ban something that you know, people can build a cheap house with mm. and things like that. So that's why they rejected the concept of banning asbestos in those countries. Yeah, and which is sort of understandable, except that the, the, yeah, the, the yeah, other people who are going to die yeah. from it go along with it. And the other thing is that it didn't stop them making money. No. You know, James Hardy is still worth billions, they don't produce any asbestos anymore. The asbestos business on its own is a loss maker, in fact. So it's just sort of stubbornness. You know, in about four generations, we might see deaths starting to go down. We haven't yet seen yeah, something like that. Yeah. Our generation is going to be dying at less than around yeah. in great numbers. Yeah. Yeah, it's a total tragedy, it's an outrage. 